Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on Indigenous Solutions to Global Challenges in Malaysian Borneo. My name is Jetty. I am the Executive Director of the Borneo Project. And today um, I'll be giving a very brief presentation followed by a panel discussion with two experts from Malaysian Borneo. So let me get started with screen share. And we'll also have time for questions at the end. All right, so um, the Borneo Project, we support indigenous led land rights and forest protection in Malaysian Borneo. We are based in the US, but during non COVID times, I'm often in Malaysia. Um, and we always start our events with a land acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge that I am currently speaking to you from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is the traditional territory of the Pueblo people. And I would like to invite all of our participants today. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourselves in the chat on Whova and say what indigenous land you are currently on in the world. Um, so I always like to start out with a map as well to make sure we all know what we're talking about and where. So this is the island of Borneo in the South China Sea and our work takes place in Sarawak. So this is one of two Malaysian states on the island of Borneo. Um, and so we have been supporting indigenous led forest protection for 30 years now, and we're responding directly to the needs on the ground. Um, so our work, what it looks like has varied throughout the years because we're um, really responding to the situation and the context. So over the years, we have supported legal aid campaigns for land rights cases, reforestation projects, establishing indigenous language preschools, and we've also been supporting communities in their campaigns to protect their land against encroachment from large scale agriculture, from logging and mega projects like mega dams. And we do all of this work in a coalition with other groups. So some of our main partners include JOAS, the, the Indigenous Peoples Network of Malaysia, Bruno Manser Funds, a Swiss organization, and Save Rivers based in Miri, Sarawak. So these are some of our allies working in the field of indigenous led land rights protection and forest protection. Uh, today, we have two folks joining us from Save Rivers and all of our collective work takes place um, using capacity building, networking, research, education and advocacy. Um, but what unifies all of these projects is that we recognize that in order for campaigns and projects to be successful, they must be championed by local communities, they must address community needs and be led by the communities who are really the experts in these landscapes. So this is our theory of change. It's how we've been operating for a long time. Um, and it is increasingly acknowledged in the scientific community that indigenous led forest protection is the best way to protect forests, the most efficient way to protect forests. And this is really important because indigenous land holds a lot of global biodiversity. So indigenous people make up less than 5% of the total human population, yet they manage or hold tenure over 25% of the world's land surface, which includes 80% of global biodiversity. Um, so protecting indigenous land and biodiversity is really imperative for global life systems to function. As I'm sure all of you know, um, one of the most obvious results of the destruction of biodiversity that we can see right now is of course the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it is human destruction of biodiversity, like the massive logging and oil palm expansion that's happening in Malaysia that is creating the conditions for new diseases like COVID-19 to emerge. So our work is really at the intersection of biodiversity and forest protection, indigenous rights and climate issues. And some examples of our work throughout the years include 
the campaign against the Bahram Dam. The Bahram Dam would have been the second largest dam of its kind in the world. It would have displaced 20,000 people and it would have flooded a huge area of forest. And a very little known fact is that tropical mega dams actually produce more greenhouse gases per megawatt of energy produced than a coal fired plant. So tropical mega dams are not renewable energy sources. So after a long campaign championed by Peter Kalang, one of our speakers today and Save Rivers, um, that involved a lot of community organizing and awareness building, um, we were able to stop the Baram Dam. Um, and rather than building large destructive infrastructure, we instead champion village scale renewable energy systems. So for example, um, this is uh, the village of Long Lawin, which has had a micro hydro renewable energy system powering their village since 2001. Another one of our big projects right now is called the Tamandamai Baram or the Baram Peace Park. So this is really a vision generated in the communities of the, low, the upper Baram River Basin to protect their forests. The idea is to secure an area of forest to stop logging, to build regenerative livelihood systems and to protect local cultures. Um, so one of the things that we're doing towards the Baram Peace Park, um, this is just a snapshot of that area. These are the Batu Siman Mountains in the Baram Peace Park area. And here's the Salungo River and you can see one of the main modes of transportation these long boats. Um, so one of the main things we're doing to support uh, indigenous led forest protection in the Baram area is through a socio-ecological survey called the Baram Heritage Survey, where we are hiring and training people from communities to collect all of the data on wildlife, hunting, fishing, and socioeconomic status in the villages. And another big campaign that I'd like to mention today is called Stop the Chop. Uh, Sarawak has experienced massive extraction of timber in the last couple decades. These are just a couple snapshots. You can see the window smudges from the airplanes. Um, so right now we have a really important campaign happening called Stop the Chop. We've all been involved in logging campaigns for many decades. This is the most recent reiteration of it. Um, and the basic situation is that there are concessions that were recently certified as sustainable. Um, and to get that certification, they had to get the free prior and informed consent of communities, or at least they were supposed to. That did not happen. So we are supporting communities who are um, do not agree with the concessions on their land and do not agree with the certification. So you can find out more at the Save Rivers website, um, saverivers.org. Um, and so that is basically the overview that I have of our work. And I would like to introduce our speakers now. Today we have joining us Peter Kalang and Celine Lim. Peter is an indigenous Kenya leader from Longyekang. He's the chairman and founding member of Save Rivers, which is our partner organization in Sarawak. He was a leading voice in the victorious campaign against the Baram Dam. And he now focuses on promoting indigenous rights in Malaysia and beyond. And we also have Celine today. Celine is an indigenous Cayenne leader from Longpila. She's on the board of Save Rivers and she heads a local NGO called Impian Makar, which organizes school collaborations to empower low income students. She's also an entrepreneur and she's worked as a youth pastor. Celine has a wealth of knowledge about the challenges facing young indigenous people in Sarawak and she's dedicated her life to sustaining their social and spiritual well being. So, welcome, Peter and Celine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Peter, is your video working? Let's see. Does it stop for a second? 
Peter, can you hear us? Well, let's see. I think Peter just dropped out of the Zoom, but we can go ahead and start um, and while we wait for him to join us again. So my first question for you, Celine, is what are some examples of community-led campaigns or projects that are inspiring you right now? And how are these projects making a difference? Uh, one of it is the Borneo Heritage Project. I think uh, Brian and a few of my other colleagues explained it really well prior to this particular session. Uh, but yeah, it's really inspiring because it's everything that you would want to see in a community-led uh, project. You know, and uh, it's really good to see that they're behind the technical part, they're understanding the land, they're understanding the biodiversity around that area. And yeah, they're, they're the leading voices and it's coming from the people. So yeah, it's very inspiring. Great, thank you. And Peter, you're back with us now. Um, so could you explain um, what are some examples of community-led campaigns or projects or initiatives that are inspiring you right now and how they're making a difference? You're on mute still. Okay. There are a number of projects which I really uh, inspire me. Uh, like this... Uh, but the, the main thing is that this, this project has to be led by the communities. And then, of course, they have to, uh, it has to start from them. Uh, one of the things that at the moment that uh, really inspire me is the initiative by the community of Long Tungan. Uh, this is a village in the Baram River in Sarawak who have uh, tried to conserve the land and in order to do that, they are trying to promote ecotourism. And of course, there's another one that uh, really inspired me is this, what we call the farm direct shop. This farm direct shop concept is uh, trying to help the small farmers, mostly indigenous people who are very good in farming, but they are not so good in uh, marketing and uh, trying to market the thing and try to promote it. So. The idea is uh, we try to create a, a center where a collection center where these farmers can come and bring, but uh, there are uh, all the standard and all the procedures and all that is all in place so that they are well paid and then the quality control is in, in place. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. And Peter, what do you think are the key elements of successful campaigns and projects? Uh, first of all, this uh, campaign is and must be from the people. And although uh, a lot of things we we have to identify first the local champions, who, and then we will uh, try to do the capacity building. Capacity building means that you, you know, build them up and try to uh, tell them what is uh, what they should do and all that. And of course, they have to believe in the course. And then after that, you know, have to and then you empower them. Otherwise, the, we we let the people to do it. All we have to do is to support them. And uh, in the campaign, there are a lot of things that we have done in that way. So. In every village, you have to identify who are the people whom you can use. And through these people, we can uh, bring the community. So without the community, it is not possible to do a proper campaign. It is the strength of the, the communities. But they have to be convinced. They have to understand, fully understand what, what it takes and all that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. What about you, Celine? What do you think are the key elements of successful campaigns and projects? I think the community themselves need to be empowered. Um, I totally agree with what Uncle Peter said in a way where they themselves need to know where they're heading, what the project is all about. Um, they are the they are the voices themselves. So I think the key of the one of the key elements of a successful campaign is really just to uh, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback on what Uncle Peter said. Uh, identifying some of the local champions and getting them to really uh, go back again to the community and communicating the vision over and over again. So part of what I do is the Tagang system. It's a it's an eco uh, preservation and rehabilitation. Uh, of aquatic life. So you identify an area with a river and you go back to the community and tell them why the no fishing, no hunting zone will be a long-term benefit for all. So that was what we needed to do over and over again, just to go back to the village, uh, listening out to their concerns, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, it's them championing the project itself. So the key elements, at least for from our experience, is to go back and really just empower them that they understand where everything is heading, what the vision is, that they themselves will be able to, to carry that narrative. So, yeah. Yeah, and what I think is really inspiring about the Tagang system um, is that this idea Tagang is it is already uh, a concept that originates. It's a traditional way of managing biodiversity. So right. it's something that's been used for a really long time um, that is just being adapted to the current context. Right, right, right. And the current context, like with everything else with the Tagang system now is this natural transition into an ecotourism spot. So that was also a vision that uh, we we wanted to leave with the community and them understanding that they will have a part to play, uh, but also knowing that it's not something instant. It will take a few years, you know, phase one of the project, phase two of the project, but it is community led, and it's really it's really rewarding to be able to do that in its season and its time. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so Celine, maybe you could talk about some of the challenges to supporting and implementing community-led projects in Sarawak. I will pinpoint to infrastructure and logistics. <laughs> uh, it's really, um, I think the, the roads back, going back to the village that has been, so we have tested this Tagang project uh, with a few uh, uh, group of people and, and part of them were, were students uh, that were from Australia. So we connected with them for a community outreach. So part of that community outreach was to also uh, gather feedback, like how, how was everything from point A to point, point Z of the project, like were they able to, to understand the culture and the heartbeat of the community? What did they think? So again, um, it's, it becomes, it, pinpoints to that, that logistic and that infrastructure, it really makes it a lot harder and it's not cheap going in uh, back to the, to that region, to, to into Baram. So yeah, um, it will definitely help a lot knowing that some of this infrastructure will be able to support uh, the, uh, the vision of the community. So I would say, yeah, travel costs, lack of infrastructure, and that also makes it a little harder, probably trying to get funding. Uh, but although, although what my village community are doing now, the, the, the lead uh, council, they are actually approaching some of the local uh, government department to kind of help, help them to get a few grants running. And they've been doing very well on that. So, but the uh, uh, pandemic is not really helping out with a lot of the process. So. Yeah, it's slowing a lot of things down. Slowing a lot of things, yes. Yeah. And <laughs> Peter, what about you? What do you think are some of the main challenges to supporting and implementing community-led projects in Sarawak? Well, I think uh, one of the, the things that we faced when we started is a lot of criticism from people. So these are things that uh, it can be a, you know, a big uh, stumbling block, but we learn as we go on that we have to learn how to be deaf and dumb to all this criticism. A lot of the criticism is because they don't have enough information and they don't appreciate what we're doing. And sometimes it is because of their political alienations and their political tendency. So that's why they uh, totally, even if you explain to them how good it is and all that, uh, it is for their benefit and it is sustainable so that the children and great-grandchildren, future generation can also benefit 
they were refused to hear. So those type of people, we that they, they are even uh, you know a big tumbling block. In, in my case, I've even experienced people who I mean, even your own close relatives who who criticize you and all that. Another thing is in this uh, part of the world, uh, NGO are uh, often labeled as troublemakers. Yeah, they are seen as not somebody who is trying to do something good for the community, but uh, is trying to destroy the livelihood and uh, and then uh, go against the uh, authorities. That is how they are labeled. So uh, that is a big hurdle for us, and especially in in some in in our state, for example, the village headman and the community headman they are being appointed by the government and they get paid by the government. So if they uh, don't you know the, if they are seen to work together with NGOs, a lot of times they are being you know they are being identified by government and they may even lose their job. We have seen that happening, and then uh, of course we have a lot of threats because now our country, like ours, which is a developing country, they are trying their best as fast as possible to make more money and trying to develop the so-called develop the land, so-called uh, to provide uh, job opportunities for the locals. So they go for logging, oil palm, mega dams, infrastructure without due consideration to the environment and human rights issues. These are challenges as well. So it is uh, sometimes we have faced uh, instances where these companies employ gangsters in order to harass the people and threaten the people. These are challenges that we have faced over the years and it's, not, it's, it's still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly still there, but even since I've been working in Sarawak, I've seen a little bit of shift, you know, in the view that NGOs are troublemakers. And I think that's in big part because of the work that Save Rivers has done to show that the primary concerns are of the community and of their territories. Um, so there's still a lot of challenges, but um, we see some shifts as well. Um, and Peter, I'd like to ask you another question, expanding on those issues a little bit. Um, what do you think are some political changes or changes to laws and policies that we need in order to empower and build indigenous-led forest protection in Sarawak? One of the things that I find is uh, because the people are not being properly consulted uh, in when projects are being carried out. Uh, for example, one good example is the Environmental Impact Assessment, EIA. When that EIA is done, the, the people who are directly affected by these projects don't have access uh, to it. Even if they have access to it, they are required to go to the office, the government office and all that to refer to it. And it is not being open up for public scrutiny. Uh, that That is one thing. And then uh, another thing is the people who do EIA, these people who are carrying out the EIA, they are paid by the developers, uh, be it the uh, people who are doing mega dams or people who are doing big plantations and all that. They get paid by the these developers, the people who own the business. So in other words, uh, in a lot of time, you know, I mean, they are indebted to developers, otherwise they don't get paid. So I think a change should be done whereby EIA should be done by a body which is neutral. It doesn't even report to the minister. It should report to a select committee or to the parliament. I believe that it should be, it should be done so that it's impartial. This is one of the things that... Uh, and then, of course, uh, the government has to recognize that NGO have a role to play in order to, you know, to make the policy uh, transparent, in order to uh, be a check and balance, so that uh, whoever it is who develop the land don't have a free hand to do whatever they want. There is a role to be played by the NGOs. In fact, one of our former prime minister, he said that NGOs 
are like eyes and ears of the government. So I like to work with NGOs. Uh, that is what he said before. So uh, other than that, I think our former chief minister, the, uh, the chief minister of Sarawak, Adananaji Satim, he was very open to NGOs. So this are the uh, uh, approach that I think the authority should take, you know, because uh, when you become a government, doesn't mean that you know everything. So you need to hear from the grassroots, you need to hear from the outside. Uh, these are some of the things that we have to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and another question, what kind of support do locally led projects need from Malaysians or from the global community? Maybe Celine, you'd like to start off with that one? I would like to highlight Stop the Chop. <laughs> Please go on to saveriver.org and find the petition, uh, sign it up. There is a whole explanation why we're doing it. I think Jetty also explained it a little bit before we started this session. So yeah, um, this, was, this will be what we need from Malaysia as a whole to really know what's happening on the ground. And yeah, saverivers.org now. Thank you. Thank you. And Peter, how about you? What kind of support can the global community provide for these issues in Malaysia? Well, the global communities, you can do a lot of things, in fact. What are these things that we are doing? We are we having oil palm plantations. These oil palm are exported to the foreign countries. So if the foreign countries don't import this oil palm, they have no market for it. The reason why, because Malaysia is... Malaysia and Indonesia, the biggest exporter of oil palm in the whole world. So if there's, uh, the foreign communities, uh, the foreign uh, countries realize that a lot of these oil palm are, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, the encroach into the native customary right lands, and then they have human rights issues and all that. And they have a lot of impact on the environment, you know, so if they don't buy it because the country is doing that, that will have a big impact. So we need you to support us uh, in this area. And beside that, uh, these people who come to do to the, to do build the dams in our country, yeah, like our, the past dams that they have built. We have people from Australia who came in. So we went to campaign in Australia, and we had people from Norway who came in to do the design of the dam. We went there. So because of that, it was, uh, that brought the success to the uh, stopping of the Baram Dam as well. Uh, this is a one contributing factor. And of course, the, you know, the big factor is because our former chief minister, Sarawak, he was very open, like what I said earlier on, willing to listen and willing to look at the study that we have uh, done. Uh, we uh, got some... I get uh, university to do the study, look at the uh, organic growth of power requirement and uh, install power and all that. And it was proven that the amount of electricity that they are going to generate with all the 12 dams is much, much, much more than they ever will need. Uh, all right, thank you. Okay, so for the rest of the time, we can take some questions from the audience. So for those of you listening in, you can, I see some of you have started already. Please send in the questions that you have. Um, so we'll start out with, um, maybe Celine, you can take this one. What kind of tourism are communities interested in? Um, and are they worried that the introduction of tourists will threaten their culture or way of life? Right, I'm probably gonna, um, going to take from at least the experience we've had with some of the international uh, students that came in and tried out at least the the method of what, how we wanted to run an ecotourism. So uh, communities are interested in telling their story and their culture and, and um, giving them or empowering them to be able to tell that story. I remember, uh, I remember just go going into my village over and over again, even teaching them a uh, uh, simple uh, exchange uh, uh, words, you know, and how do you explain beads? How do you explain, weave, how do you explain weaving? So that kind of, of tourism, which, which they could tell their own story, 
And uh, so I think that's part of ecotourism <laughs> and it's a lifestyle tourism. I think that, that you're inviting people to, to, to come in and, and see how they live their life, what kind of food they eat and, and the kind of culture that they, that they are embedded in. So uh, we worry. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, because we're worried, that's why there must be an intention behind uh, everything that we're doing. Uh, probably uh, even for this group of students that came in, um, spending, spending a few sessions with them and explaining who the communities were and why, how they would respond, what their worldviews are. And, and so it's educating not just the community, but even also the tourists that comes in. So I don't know how they would probably work in the long run when more new people are coming in, but education, I think on both ends and having someone that in between that's able to, to connect th that two worlds. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The ecotourism um, industry in the bottom area is still in its- Not there. <laughs> Yeah, the infrastructure is still preventing it from getting too yep. big. So that is not yet a worry that yes. is really prevalent in the bottom area. Um, there's another question. Most community-based projects have been identified to lose continuity following the withdrawal of support by funding agencies, even after they have attained sustainability. What could be the root cause of this and how can it be addressed? Um, I'd actually say that in Sarawak, that is not yet a big problem because we don't get funding very easily in Sarawak. Mm -hmm. So we haven't really had to deal with that very much. I think a lot of funders have stayed away from Sarawak um, because of the extractive practices. I think they were um, wary. Those have those um, concerns are still prevalent from funders, even though um, it is really a great area to invest in, in terms of community-based sustainability. Um, let's see. Ah, here's a good one for you, Peter. It is mentioned that political leaders want to bring development via dams and modernization. Do you question the concept of development? Is this concept um, different from what the communities see as development? First of all, I think development should be something doesn't bring destruction. It should be a development which benefits the people. In the case of dams, uh, look at what happened to the Bakun Dam, Batangai Dam, and then of course now we had the Murum Dam, and soon we're going to have Baleh Dam. These dams, except for the Baleh Dam, all the others, they involve uh, being uh, people are being dislocated or uh, they are being resettled to other places. And then they lose the land, they lose all the uh, farms and the, the home are being flooded, the graveyard, and everything there is swiped out. So, and then they have to start life from zero, you know, a lot of cases. And of course, they are given houses and all that, but all the other things, all the things that they have planted all their life, not only all their life, but also from the parents, is all gone. So definitely it's not bringing a lot, uh, doing a lot of uh, injustice to the people who are affected. And then, of course, uh, the people affected, they have to start from scratch. Uh, a lot of them don't get the same amount of land that they lost. And then when they get paid for the land that is flooded, the the what they are paid for is negligible actually if the amount of land that they are being uh, lost, yeah. yeah. So you can see if you go to the places where uh, they are being resettled, I think it's about thirty percent of this uh, village uh, only uh, the villages are staying there. Seventy percent of them would move out to the urban areas to look for jobs and all that. So these are uh, this type of development, what we understand by development, I mean, the people, the indigenous people, they, they want development, but they don't want destruction. Okay? So this type of development doesn't bring benefit to the people who are affected directly. But who are the people who benefit? 
is the people who are building this smelter plant for aluminium and the people who are consuming electricity in town for the factories and all that. And the people, of course, the people who sell cement, sell steel, and the people who are building the roads, all these are big companies and even a lot of them are also from uh, international companies and all that coming in. So, and besides, so the wealth is not fairly distributed to the people. So the people themselves who own the land in the end become laborers a lot of time, like in uh, oil palm. Suddenly, when one morning they wake up, they find out that they are living inside an area which is given out for oil palm plantation. All their life, they have thought, you know, that this land is their native customary red land. And then the land is given out to big companies for planting, uh, for uh, plantations. So this type of thing is not development. Development is for, well, for the overall good of everybody, you know, not just a few people on top there. Yeah, thank you for that. And we have a question for you, Celine, about the Tagao system. So um, is there any policy dialogue about the Tagal Hutan? So that would be referring to a community agreement on managing um, forests. Hutan means forest. So is there any policy dialogue about Tagal Hutan to be established as a national customary system? Um, are these indigenous solutions adopted more widely across Malaysia? Uh, at the moment in time, no. Uh, there is no policy dialogue uh, in regards to Tagal Hutan. And, um, but on the local fishery department, the local fishery agency, they are, they are encouraging the Tagang system and the Tagal system. Uh, we have had the officers coming in to help us check the, the water source and everything. So on a, on a pocketed efforts, they are, but it is not adopted to this, which to a whole national or a, a greater greater scale uh, effort. So uh, the answer to that would be no, there isn't. It would be great if we could establish a Tagan or Tagal system. Right. Um, I mean, if indigenous people could manage the land the way that they know how to, if that was the national system, that would be great. If we could. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah, and that's part of the Baram Peace Park. That initiative is really empowering people to make those decisions about managing their land. So um, for that area, it would be adopted in a, in a wider context, not just at the village level. Yeah. Um, and another question we have, it's sometimes hard to avoid palm oil. What would you say is the better way? Avoiding it completely or buying products using sustainably sourced palm oil? So this, um, I'll take this question um, because we have a lot of people ask us around the world. Malaysians in general are not as concerned about avoiding palm oil in their products because it's pretty much impossible to do in Malaysia but there is a lot of momentum in the EU and in other places. Um, I guess avoiding it altogether and is good, but also generating awareness in general. So generating awareness about all of the products that you're consuming. Where are all of your products coming from? Um, it's not just oil palm that is causing deforestation, although that is a big one. And of course, sustainably sourced palm oil is probably better than regular palm oil, but it still has its flaws, as we can see in the RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil has had a lot of different um, issues in their certified palm oil. Um, I think they're doing um, the, the best job of, sustain, of certifying it that exists, but it's still, um, unclear how big the impact is on sustainable palm oil versus unsustainable palm oil. Um, and another question for you, Peter, how are you dealing with the issue of out migration from longhouses? So people moving to the cities, how can projects be designed in a way so that people stay in their kampong? So kampong is village. This is one big issue. Uh, 
the root cause of rural urban migration is of course first of all you don't have enough uh, good infrastructure you don't have good roads you don't have hospitals you don't have good schools you know you name it so even clean water electricity so this is one reason why they come to the town and so if you want to them to to be in the village first of all we have to start with good infrastructure and then we need to uh, look at the livelihood how do you uh, create a livelihood that is suitable not everybody wants to become a farmer okay? so probably we can uh, look at smi the small and medium sized industries uh, which will provide jobs for the people in the rural area like it does in a lot of developed countries not everybody is living in a city no they can live in the suburbs and all that but they have all the amenities so it is even better to live in the in the suburb areas if you have all these amenities that they have in town uh, so that is the first thing infrastructure you have to do it and create it good and of course palm oil and all that we are also looking at that at the moment we are looking at agroforestry uh, which are more friendly eco friendly in fact a lot of people think that this agroforestry is something new but in fact this is a, a what you call a traditional practice by the indigenous people uh, the people in borneo like it does in any other part of the world where indigenous people have their own way of farming and all that so I think that that is the best thing to the infrastructure and provide a sustainable livelihood for the people. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think we will just have time for one or two more questions. Um, Peter, this one's for you. Peter, you mentioned that the minister, so I think Adnan um, was willing to listen to you for one of your campaigns, like on the Baram Dam. How did you make this connection and get a meeting? And how is this willingness fostered with decision makers? Well, uh, we what we did with Adadan was uh, we had a lot of work behind that. <clears throat> First of all, the campaigns, uh, we started with signature campaigns. We collected about 20,000 uh, signatures. And then we we did some uh, police reports, you know, we, because a lot of these uh, ministers said that a lot of people agreed to the dam. And then they had a lot of meetings and all that. And uh, But the people who come to the meeting, a lot of those people have nothing to do with the Baram. They're from other parts of Sarawak or even other parts of Malaysia. And then uh, they are not from the village. A lot of them are uh, government officers and people like that. So they just make up number, numbers and all that. So anyway, we did a lot of that. And then we did a lot of studies. Like I said earlier on, we got his... Uh, uh, the University of California in Berkeley to do a study on the uh, installed power of electricity in Sarawak and uh, the projected organic uh, growth and projected industrial growth and all that. And we proven by the study done by the University of Berkeley was more than the, in percentage wise, more than China required at the peak of the industrialization. Uh, uh, so with all these figures and all the things that we did, we were able to convince him uh, to listen to us. And of course, uh, we went through his friends, <laughs> his friends who, who knew him well, to talk to him nicely. We are not coming here to, you know, to protest anything, but we want to talk face to face. So that's why uh, Chief Minister Adenan at that time, uh, he, he was one out of thousand or even two thousand five thousand head i mean a chief minister that ever or politician that i've ever seen who would be willing to give a listening ear to to people like the ngos and the cso's and all that so that is what convinced him we have to come with the facts and figures and also we come with a community support all this that's, that's what convinced him yeah Thank you for that. Well, we are just at time right now, but um, I'd just like to thank you both for joining us today. It's great to see you since I can't see you in Malaysia right now. And a big thanks to the GLF team for helping us put this session together. 
Um, you can learn more at either of our websites, borneoproject.org or saverivers.org, and feel free to be in touch with us. Um, and we'll try and get to any questions that you send our way. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.